AWS Loft Talks. I'm the creator of Jenkins, and I work on this project day in day out. Now, one of the things this project does over time is that it has grown from this my little hobby project under my desk to this large deployment that drives you know, tens or even hundreds of computers. So today I thought I wanted to talk about this, I guess, the journey. Um, because you know, as you know, I guess especially people in here, you know, being able to harness the power of all these computers that's available to us is becoming increasingly important. Um, and then, so this part, I think, is worth talking about. So uh, this project kind of originally started as my hobby project in around 2004 or five or something like that. Um, and I used to work for Sun Microsystems, so we get all this like a desktop computer under my desk. But it was not very fast. The Spark CPUs are not very good, so our laptops were better. So we kind of left them dormant. So uh, on uh, the weekend, I wrote this program that then eventually became Jenkins. And for the longest time, he was running under, sort of as a single computer under my desk. So if you think about this path of your build environment going from you know, the single static environment all the way to the elasticity, well, I guess this is probably the first state a lot of people are in. You know, having a one computer that's running your Jenkins instance, maybe under your desk, hopefully in the rack mounted, but that sort of state. This has been happy enough for, uh, let's say, I, I would say about a year. <laughs> uh, a lot of people around me started picking this up, and then so they started putting the workload. And at one point, this little computer was running like six or eight concurrent builds and test executions. And then so everything is grinding down into a halt. <laughs> Um, and then so one, you know, the, obviously one machine can only handle so much workload, and now we got a lot of workload that we want these programs, programs like Jenkins to do. So uh, during the, uh, the New Year break, I expanded Jenkins substantially. I ripped apart a lot of code, and then I made it support this distributed builds. So going from one to two was kind of painful, right? I have to write all this code. But once I got, you know, once I expanded the program, I could now drive more and more computers. So it turns out that this was around the time Sun was kind of going down the toilet, you know. Those of you who know that company, by the way. Um, so every once in a while, people get laid off. And so when I discover that the layoff has happened, like I go to their offices and they don't care about the computers. That's the last thing they worry about. So I just kind of grab them and put it under my desk and then, uh, and then eventually I got access to the lab, which is like air conditioned. And apparently you needed to have this like a, some kind of clearance to get your badge scanned and then get into the room. And one day I managed to do that and there was like a treasure trove. All these computers had, like a, some of them have a name, so people who are no longer with the company. So I was able to grab them. Um, and in some other cases, I just switched the machine off and then like I leave. And then three days later I come back if the machine is still turned off, probably nobody cares about it, so I'm gonna grab that computer and it's mine. So you know, that way, over time, I built this very significant sort of cluster. And uh, so you know, I had this workload problem resolved. I think that's the kind of often the state in which many people's build infrastructure are. So you have a no number, of potentially large number of hand-curated servers that's all running builds. And then, so it's great that you have you know, say 10 machines, I can, in my case I have about 30 machines, but it's still, um, um, but that's, that's where, you know, the second step of elasticity ladder, I think, is the, the going from the single instance to this static set of slaves. Now, that's sort of good, but not, it's not very good, because in some ways, the environment like that is both over-provisioned and under-provisioned at the same time. You know, in the weekend and the night time, there was nothing going on. So all these computers are eating electricity, doing nothing. So you're contributing to the global warming. That's not good. But during the, right before the release cycle, so when the sprint is about to conclude, like, you know, all the instances get busy, and there's not enough of them to make sure that this last minute fix gets tested. So things, you know, things that, again, like I, the, there's not enough capacity, and people get frustrated. So. You know, that's kind of like how stadiums are, right? Most of the time of the day, it's completely empty, wasting the space, but during the game nights, like, it's completely get packed, and then there's not enough seats to go around. So obviously, I kind of know the answer how we want to solve this problem, which is you want this elasticity in the real environment by bringing in the, the sort of harness the power of cloud, you know, like AWS. Um, so that's what I 
done. Uh, so at one point, I wrote this uh, Amazon EC2 plugin. So the idea is that the Jenkins is kind of watching its own workload, and it recognizes that, oh, I got so much work to do, but I don't enough build slaves to, to process them. And then they can, you know, it uses my credential to launch new EC2 instances, and then use that IP address to connect and then launch my build agent. And then it becomes the build slave. And then once you know, the, or the work disappears, then I can start to shut down. When I switched it on, it was kind of a scary experience because it was on my, on my personal credit card, and I was kind of worried that the, the bug could cost me personally. But in, you know, over time, it was clear that this something like this is very useful. So I think you know, the, a lot of people nowadays kind of do something like this. Um, and uh, the, so the result is that you get this dynamic pool of slaves that can adjust to the capacity. So you don't have to worry about whether Know, how many machines you need at any given time because the software regulates for itself. Keep these build saves running for a long period of time in a healthy, usable state actually requires some maintenance work, the monitoring, and that sort of thing. So often people do not write like good test script. So when the test fails in the middle, sometimes like the processes get left behind. So if you don't check for those, then over the time, those things will slowly clog up and it makes the build stays unreliable. And then the, the last thing you want as a guy who is maintaining a build environment is to have this infrastructure that the people do not trust. Like, you know, people, engineers start saying, oh, well, the build has failed on the Jenkins, but you know, it fails all the time, so let's just wait for another run before we really start acting on it. And that's a big problem. But, well, so if you now if you switch your mindset to this dynamic slave pool mindset where you can provision your instances in you know, left and right and throw them away, it's much easier. Instead of spending all this time monitoring and cleaning thing, that things up, you just want to throw them away and then bring in a new one. You know, it's just another instance of the same kind. And our pricing model and everything in the cloud kind of encourages that sort of use. And then so that's we discover that new sort of state in mind. And I think that's somewhat commonly deferred to as this in a pet versus cattle mindset, right? It's, if when you have a static set of build slaves, I have all these names assigned to these build slaves, and uh, I name them all after butlers. So there's like Alfred, and there's like a Jeeves, and so on. And then I knew which one tends to be good and which one tends to be bad, and so it's like, you know, I have this intimate relationship with, with my build slaves. Um, but with the uh, dynamic slave pool, you completely change the mindset. You know, you get every one of them gets this crazy, undescriptable I, you know, I want to five, five or oh, you know, whatever number that it is, and then uh, when it's gone, like I don't think of it twice. And then, so that's sort of important mindset that goes in from the slave pool to the dynamic pool that you sort of start to become handle the machines as a mass instead of the collection of individuals, and. Um, so that, I think, is a critical sort of like a part in the, this journey through the, the elastic build environment. Now, the, I thought um, that was the end of the story, right? I had the build saves I could adjust, and then I thought my mission was accomplished until um, later um, I started working as a, in CloudBees, and then so I started seeing a lot bigger deployments of Jenkins. So at Sun, you know, the, every group had its own life, and the, so they control their own destiny. So I only had to support this build environment for, let's say, I don't know, maybe 100 engineers, something like that. So I could handle all that with single instance, with having enough capacity. But you know, nowadays, when we talk about the automations in mainstream companies, their engineering services department wants to run sort of build environment as a service to the entire organization that might have thousands of developers. So in, I, you know, I often see this monumental, hugely horizontally scalable Jenkins instance that has hundreds. The, the biggest fund I've seen has like a 1,600 build slave attached to a single master. Um, and that's kind of, I, I was sort of, I was shocked in awe, but it's also not really the place that you want to be. So. I started realizing that the, the sort of the last step of this evolution of the elastic build environment is to actually start thinking of masters, Jenkins masters, as something expendable. So instead of having this like a one massively monolithic Jenkins instance uh, care carefully curated, it's actually much better to sort of have a lot of smaller instances that you don't particularly care about, right? 
when you're talking about things at that scale, um, you know, you have all these product teams and the, the, like a line of business guys that you don't want to know about, right? You can't personally support them. So the model you want to get to uh, is that the, you, know, you, you, you provide this ability to run lots of masters for these guys and then you only manage the cluster as a whole and then kind of detach yourself from what's going on in the individual masters. So at Clabby, that's a, sort of one of the latest effort that we are working on. Um, really to provide, yes, the sort of Jenkins as a service and make things the sort of, sort of self-service. Right? So the developers could come in when they are launching a new project, they could press a button that would provision a new instance of Jenkins, give them a new issue tracker component and then give them whatever, like a Git hosting and all the other things that you want to get. So what I'm discovering nowadays uh, is that a lot of large companies around the Bay Area is building that sort of services internally. And um, in the Jenkins project, we did these uh, user conferences every year, and a number of them came to talk about well, how they do it. So that's the, um, the, the mindset here. Um, and so I was watching those, and, then, and I was thinking that, well, then that, so people are solving all this problem on their own and not particularly sharing what they are doing with the rest of the community. Yes, they share the blog, but that's very different from actually like, sharing the functional software, right? Um, and whereas in CloudBees, we have this publicly facing service called Debug Cloud, which actually sort of provides Jenkins as a service to thousands of customers that they, they basically run their Jenkins masters on us, and then we in turn run those on EC2, and then we built this infrastructure around to sort of make them scale and make them manageable and operatable with just a handful of people. So we thought, well, this is kind of exactly what they want, except all these companies that they, they're doing this, they cannot use our publicly facing services on the internet for you know, all sorts of reasons. Um, so instead, we wanted to take this technology and then to, to the people. So that's what we are kind of building as Tiger, which is the name of this project. Um, and um, the idea is, you know, we use this uh, cluster management software like uh, the Mesos or Kubernetes, right? So we reduce the set, set of work into uh, a series of containers. And then so the sort of, as a guy who needs to manage this environment, your view of the world becomes, well, I got lots of, you know, I got very fixed number of big honking boxes that is going to host all your containers that are the masters or build slaves. And in the front end, you have a, so the HTTP reverse proxy that's sitting there so that the people would access your instances by their familiar name and they don't, they don't really know. In fact, nobody really needs to know which one of these instances where things are running. And uh, Jenkins needs to, well, persist your uh, the binaries and uh, the source code and change logs and whatnot in the storage. So there's a big storage in the behind the scene that's connected to all the masters that's running here. Um, and then that's how, um, uh, that's how the whole system is put together. So again, in this, the, the view that you as the engineering service guy, the, the guy who manages this Jenkins as a service in the company, you see, there's no master in any of this. But what's going on is if you look at one of these big honking boxes, inside it, you're running, you know, the your cluster scheduling software is basically running lots of workload as a container. So some of them might be masters. So, you know, if I, uh, if I launch a new project and then I get my own master, maybe it's actually landing here. Um, and then some other containers might be also running on them, which is the, uh, the Jenkins slaves that actually running on the build. And then so this whole software, you know, the cluster management software will make sure that the, you know, the available boxes gets used for the build workload or the masters. If the, uh, the master goes down, then they'd be capable of redistributing the work elsewhere and that sort of things. So in the, the end result is you have this, um, you have this, uh, the, the, system, the series of boxes that can house as many sort of masters or slaves as you need. And then you, know, you, you kind of get detached from all these things that's going on. And all you have to do is to make sure that the cluster as a whole operates okay. And then if the capacity starts to run out, then you have to bring in a few more boxes. And again, if you're running something like this on EC2, then it's might very easy to launch just another CC 8x large instances. So that's sort of, to me, is the last step in this elasticity ladder, which is to kind of apply the same deep of mindset that you went from the static set of build slaves to the dynamic set of build slaves, and then do the same thing with the masters. So go from curated master to this 
massive masters that you don't particularly care about. I guess thank you very much. <laughs>